All right, so this talk is going to be on this title, The Seen, the Unseen, and the Unrealized. So I want to start by asking, how many of you have heard of The Seen and the Unseen before? Raise your hands. Okay, so I have about one third of my talk left. Because you, you know the first two thirds already. Okay, so seriously though, this is um, based off of my book from 2016, one of the two from 2016. The seen, the unseen, and the unrealized, how regulations affect our everyday lives. Um, I don't have a copy because the store had a, a shipping snafu. But we do have these a little here and there. So if you want to order a copy, you can order it using this QR code. And the best price in the world is from the Mises store. Okay, so. I'm going to go through the seen and the unseen a little quickly, since you know this stuff already. And then we're going to move on uh, to see where my analysis and my, my addition to this sort of differs from the standard take and how I add to it. OK, so this starts with Frederick Bastiat. And you know him from, from mid 19th century, right? The liberal economist, the French guy who was a master on uh, economic rhetoric. And he says, between a good and a bad economist, this constitutes the whole difference. The one takes account of the visible effect, the other takes account both of the, uh, the effects which are seen and also of those which it is necessary to foresee. Now this difference is enormous for it almost always happens that when the immediate consequence is favorable, the ultimate consequences are fatal and the converse. Hence it follows that the bad economist, that's not me, uh, <laughs> pursues a small present good, which will be followed by a great evil to come, while the true economist, that would be more like me, uh, <laughs> pursues a great good to come at the risk of small present evil. So you can see how important this is, right? To not only look at what is going on, but also look at what would have happened otherwise. Okay, so he tells the story about the broken window. And when you, when you hear broken window, you probably think of Paul Krugman, and that's pretty accurate. So he tells the, the, uh, the story about the broken window and how the shopkeeper's son breaks the window. And a, a number of people gather, and at first they don't really, they think the, son, the shopkeeper's son has done something bad, something naughty, right? And then they realize, well, wait a minute, this is actually a pretty good thing because this means the shopkeeper needs to buy a new window pane. So it's more business for the glazer which is a good thing, right? Because there's more spending in the economy and it's the wheels start turning and all this stuff, right? And as Austrians, we don't really believe in wheels, but let, let's get to that, okay? What it means is that every downside has an upside and vice versa, just like in, in Bastia's uh, quote before. And it's not really a zero-sum game, right? It's, and it's not, a, it's not really a gain to destroy something either, right? So. This is a story about opportunity cost. If you've read Bas not Bas yet, uh, Henry Hazlitt's uh, Economics in One Lesson, you know that he's basically copying, plagiarizing, if you will, Bastiat, and talking about the opportunity cost. And the one lesson is like 35 lessons in one, and all of them are about this other side of the story that we have to consider. Because economics is all about the trade-off. It's about figuring out what is the true cost of something. And the opportunity cost, we know, that is what we could have done but didn't because we chose this other thing, right? And that's how we evaluate any situation, any choice that we make. Okay, so in this case, the glacier's gain gains because the shopkeeper loses the window, right? That's what we see. But what we do not see is that the shopkeeper would probably have done something with that money if he did not have to buy a new, a new window. And in Bastia's story, it's a, he would buy a shoe, or a couple of shoes, I guess, a pair of shoes. A pair of shoes. In, in Hess, you didn't get that one, did you? Okay, next time. In Hazlitz's story, it's, a, it's buying a coat or something like that instead. But that's what we do not see, right? He buys the window instead of buying what he otherwise would have bought. So you can't really say it is a gain that the, the glazier uh, gets to sell a window. 
because at the same time, the shoemaker does not get to sell a pair of shoes, assuming they cost about the same. Okay, so we need to consider both. And if we do, it then becomes obvious that this is not really a gain, and it's not there really zero sum either, it's a loss, right? Because the shoemaker gets to, uh, does not get to sell, the glazer gets to sell, that's plus minus zero we can, we can say, but the shopkeeper loses a window. So it's a, a net negative, okay? So what is fascinating about this tale and how Bastia sets this, sets this up, let's look at this a little bit. Because what he says here is really that we maintain a sort of free market situation where the choice is voluntary, where the exchanges are voluntary and for mutual gain, okay? Which means he is pursuing what is highest on his value scale. Right? So the reason he buys a window instead of the shoes is because that's higher on his value scale. He didn't need one before, but after he loses the window and there's a big hole in it, then, yeah, then he, he, he values that much higher than the shoes he would otherwise have gotten. Right? So he's still following his preferences even though he, he lost the window. Okay? It's, it's really a static view. It's a static view of that choice, that choice situation, which is either with a window or without a window, and how he would choose uh, considering uh, his, his son's rocks and playing with rocks. Okay, so it, it's an either-or analysis, right? It's pretty standard. It's, it's pretty mainstream even, right? Even in, in mainstream economics courses, we teach opportunity cost, and or at least hopefully, economics professors would teach you opportunity cost day one in the principles of economics course that you took, Econ 101. Okay, so what we have then from an Austrian perspective is the value scale where he all, the shopkeeper already has the window pane. That's what the, the check mark means. He already has that. That is satisfied already. So next on his list is a pair of shoes. He doesn't have that yet, but he's going to buy it. And then, of course, if he loses uh, the window, then he's still going to go for that what is highest unsatisfied want on his value scale, right? So in that sense, he's still just acting normally, no, no problem, right? Okay? Now, let's aggregate this or blow this up into a bigger example. And I've chosen to just, let's drop a few bombs in the city. Uh, and I chose one at random. It turned out to be Dresden in Germany. <laughs> Maybe in, in this crowd, I, I, I should have chosen, like, Washington, D.C. or something. <laughs> but anyway, so here we have the same thing, but on, on, a, on an aggregate level where you smash the whole city with bombs akin to breaking the window. No one dies. No one is harmed other than we lose this property, OK? Nothing really changes. After we lose the buildings, ah, we sort of need a shelter. We need somewhere to live. So we will focus our energy on rebuilding the city rather than doing what else we would have done. Maybe we would have met up with friends in coffee shops or, or planned our vacation or whatever. But those things are not as important anymore. They're lower on the value scale, right? So after, this, after the, the bombs over Dresden, we're focusing on, on this, this uh, unsatisfied want, which is higher on our value scale. Of course, we get really busy doing this because this is really high on our value scale. So not having a place to live, then we would not consider leisure to be all that important anymore. So you'd probably invest more of our time, more of our efforts, more of our savings, assuming we have any, and so forth, right, into build, rebuilding the city. So there will be a whole lot of more activity because we want just roof over our heads, okay? This new activity is what, what, what Paul Krugman would call economic growth. We would not. Right? This is simply a choice considering the opportunity cost. Right? And in this case, we're, leisure is simply not very high on our value scale anymore when we don't have a home. Okay? So what does this mean then? Well, it means that our demand for construction materials goes up quite a bit. We have a whole, whole city to rebuild. 
uh, this means uh, that we are will willing to pay a higher price and building uh, construction materials from the whole region, well, I mean, they can make money off of shifting their uh, resources and transporting them into Dresden for us to rebuild. Okay, higher profits, hey, why not? Supply chains, they start pumping out even more goods and so forth. And all of this, of course, we see in economic statistics. This is not very strange, right? This is a pretty, pretty standard um, economic story. Right? This is what we would expect. The, mar the market works. It directs resources to where they are, they are most highly valued, which in this case is Dresden and reconstructing the, um, the city. There would also be, of course, disaster relief from all kinds of organizations. Maybe even the government will, will help people out and so forth. This is the same story, right? They've suffered a loss, but they're still focusing on whatever is highest unattained value on their value scales. I think we can all agree on that, right? So the action is still their voluntary action. It's they're still following whatever it is that they value most highly, subjectively speaking, even on an aggregate level. <clears throat> so the economics of this, of course, is that, yeah, we have a temporary loss. We have a temporary setback. We lost wealth. It's the window or it's the city. One of the two, right? Prices suggest uh, people's actions. They adjust them to. Uh, they shift their resources to where they do most good, which is where they have the highest value and so forth. This is a standard uh, story for any economist, right? This is what we would, would expect. But let's look at something different. Then. Let's look at what, a, what about a regulation? which is what my, my book is about, is different. So far we talked about destruction. We don't have to talk about how that happened or anything, but what about regulations? Well, any regulation is really a restriction on how you may act or how someone may act, okay? It's a prohibition on specific actions. I think you agree with me. A lot of people on Twitter do not agree with this. <laughs> So it can also be that you're prohibiting an action unless you fulfill a certain criteria. But it's still a prohibition, right? You can't do unless you, either you can't do at all or you can do if you are licensed and you check all these boxes and, and what have you, right? That's a regulation, okay? So what, th what this means is, of course, that a regulation is effective if it is an action that could have taken place. And this goes back a little bit to what, what, what Professor Engelhardt was talking about last uh, lecture, right? The minimum wage, a minimum wage that is set much lower than the market wage doesn't really have an impact at all. So any regulation, of course, needs to regulate something that people would choose to do otherwise, or it's ineffective. It doesn't have any effect. Okay, so it must be something that is formally, physically, and economically feasible for actors. Okay, well, that means that the regulation itself is not a destruction, because it's a prohibition, it's a ban, but it's still destructive, and let's look at what, uh, what that means. Okay, so let's assume that the CDC, and we all know what the organization that is now, um, let's, see that, let's say, say that they issue a, a ban on touch screens, because people uh, touch touch screens, this is, well, pretty <laughs> obvious. And they have germs on their fingers, so there's a risk for spreading disease. So it's within the CDC's uh, competence. So here we have Dr. Anthony iPad Fauci. I'm pretty proud of this, actually. <laughs> so they, they issue this ban on, on uh, touch screens. So what is the effect, then, of this regulation? Well, let's assume that this is uh, a user's value scale, this, the, the uh, table down here. <clears throat> With new regulation, at the top of the very list, they wanted to get an iPad touch. I'm oh, sorry, an iPod touch. This might be before your time, I don't know. But... And the, as alternatives, they could get a Walkman. You might not know what that is. But that's a, sort of a, a portable cassette player. And a cassette was sort of a 
No. <laughs> Never. <laughs> okay, so, or even lesser value is a portable radio. So those are, those are my options, because I want to carry music with me. And if I would be able to choose freely, and let's assume that they cost the same and whatnot else, I would pick the iPod Touch. Well, with CDC's ban, I can no longer pick the iPod Touch because it has a touch screen. The other ones do not, okay? Which means that option is taken away from me, correct? It's not destroyed, it's not impossible. I didn't lose the window or the city. We didn't lose touch screens immediately necessarily. We have the knowledge, we have the production facilities and everything, right? So this is not really a one-time loss, right? Reality is the same. Reality didn't change. Not like in the other examples where the window broke or Dresden broke. Here, it's all the same. The only thing that is different is that a ban has been issued. So we can no longer use touch screens. No one can use touch screens because of the risk for disease, which means an option is lost to us. Right? but it's not destroyed. Well, that means that someone who wants to replace uh, their device or someone who wants to upgrade the device or someone like me who, wanted to, who didn't have before but want to have music in my pocket, I can't get my, what is highest on my list anymore, correct? Which makes this different because I can no longer pursue the highest valued attainable want on my list because right? I'm not allowed. That's different. And it means every time I purchase things, that thing is still on my value scale, correct? Because I know it's possible and it was there yesterday, which means every time I make a choice, I lose that option. I have to go for something that is further down in my value scale. So I lose the difference every time until I update my value scale or I don't give a damn anymore, correct? I didn't lose anything, I lost the option, so I lost the difference to the next highest valued uh, end, okay? Now, this is still fairly static, but the economy is not, right? So the only thing we've done now is said that, well, with the regulation, yeah, the option is taken away from us, so every time we make the choice, we're gonna lose a little bit instead of with destruction, when in one situation we lost a bunch of wealth or a bunch of capital, okay? The economy is, is different. A destruction doesn't repeat itself unless it's by a Keynesian. But, but the choices, we make choices every day, a lot of them, right? So unless we update our value scales, we're gonna have this tiny little loss over and over and over again. But there's more to it, right? Because it's not about consumption. Consumption is not the economy, right? The, the economy is production. It's different. So producers are prohibited from selling touchscreens. So producers of touchscreens, they will either exit the market completely, they will pull the plug on their businesses, or they will uh, reinvest in something else, do something similar, but there's not a touchscreen. Maybe they could have like a point screen that you, that you point at from an inches uh, distance or something like that but it still mean, means that they will need to invest money and resources into changing the products because they can't sell the touchscreen anymore. Okay, well, this means that we get more of other types of goods because that's where the resources go. We, of course, get less touchscreens because they're not allowed to produce those. So we get overproduction of other goods, underproduction of the goods that we could have bought yesterday but can no longer, right? So the production structure is, is distorted. It goes away from what entrepreneurs had already figured out that consumers wanted to some secondary uh, choice that entrepreneurs think that might, they might want, right? So that's a distortion, because usually they would go for whatever consumers value the most. Okay, this is not a big surprise. This is sort of simple analysis, right? Yeah, regulations distort the production structure. Duh, tell me there's something I don't know. Right? As Austrians, we understand this. As ma mainstreamers, they're lost already. Okay? So we lose those options. What is the unrealized then? What, is, what, is, what does this mean? 
Well, there's something more to it since the market economy is a process and not a static state and definitely not a number of static states after each other. The problem is on the production side because innovation is not, it does not come from nowhere at all like that. And whoops, a completely new thing. It is pretty evolutionary, even though it's innovative and seems really revolutionary, especially after the fact, it's really a process itself with entrepreneurs building off of ideas from, from each other and borrowing ideas from other parts of the economy and using whatever um, knowledge they have from other areas and combining those bits and pieces and go, whoa, this is a, this is a possibility, I'll try this, okay? So here you have the, uh, the evolution of the touchscreen devices. In this case, it's the, the world of Apple, brought to you by the world of Pear. Again? Okay, whatever. I won't try again. So in Apple invented the iPod and the iPod Touch where you could have 10,000 songs in your pocket. Right? And then they invented the iPhone, which was basically the 10,000 songs with an internet connection. You could place a phone call on it, which led in, into becoming the iPad. And now we're back to Anthony iPad Fauci. Okay? Well, they're learning, right? They're they keep developing these products, keep innovating, keep uh, developing new uh, solutions, and they learn in each generation, they learn how to do it better, and they figure out how to produce better things. It's not the case that so suddenly someone was like, you know, smartphone. No, because you had all these other products first. And some of you might have heard of the Newton and things like that, 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 the, that Apple had way before the iPod too. And they tried all these things and eventually they will figure out a product that actually is of value to consumers. Okay, so if we then apply our Austrian process perspective on this and realize that the market economy is an unfolding process that is uncertain, that is entrepreneurially driven, where whatever seems to work is where the resources are directed, but they're still aiming, they're aim, aiming for another point in the future still. Let's look at what this means then, okay? So if there is a touch screen ban, nothing will happen after the iPod, and the iPhone is not possible because it is a touch screen. Imagine a smartphone without a touch screen. What the heck is that? It's just a big phone. It's, it's not very useful, right? So you need to figure something else out, something completely different. You also would not have a tablet because it's also built off of what they learned from, from producing the smartphone. Instead, we get resources allocated into something else, producing something that entrepreneurs think, well, this is at least allowed to produce, but without a touch screen. So we would get something different, that's true. But we will not get the knowledge necessary uh, and the experience necessary to produce these other goods, those goods that we all have in our pockets pretty much, the smartphones and, and the, the tablets and whatever comes next. I have no idea what that is, but something glorious. Okay? This means also then that we don't get the jobs, we don't develop the expertise, we don't even get the organizations, the firms, the production facilities, the technology. None of that happens because of the ban on touchscreens because there's no use in investing in all this stuff, okay? So all of this stuff never happens. It never sees the light of day. All these business firms, this, maybe this new uh, market niche, this industry never happens, okay? So now we get to the issue of the unrealized. It's not the seen, it's not the unseen, because that's static in the now, in the present, or maybe tomorrow. But over time, what happens, it's, what does not happen that would have happened without regulations, okay? So think about that. You need to be an Austrian to understand this because the market unfolds and it's cumulative, right? What is being produced for tomorrow is based off of what we learned producing for today in the aggregate, okay? So the market structurally from a, cons a consumer satisfaction point of view is very different. 
the whole economy is different, correct? It's not simply, oh yeah, Apple is doing something differently. No, we just said that this affects the whole supply chain of touch screens, all the products that are made and could be made from touch screens, all the suppliers to these businesses, the jobs, the knowledge, the expertise, the technologies that come with it, they're not developed. Instead, we have these resources invested somewhere else. And that somewhere else is necessarily aiming for something that entrepreneurs think is lower, think, think are, are lower on consumers' value scales than what they otherwise would have chosen. Right? Because of course they're going to aim for the highest value that they can imagine. That's pretty obvious, right? So the whole economy is on a different value creative trajectory. So it's aiming up here, but now with the ban, oops, no, it's down here instead. Which means we're gonna get diff different type of growth, a different type of market, and we're gonna be poorer. We're gonna be less well off as a result, and we're gonna get completely different goods, completely different careers for people, right? Our choice situation when going to college, say, or when we graduate from college and we get out in the job market, because of this ban on touch screens, the jobs are different, the careers are different. Maybe it serves me personally because I, I have a, the type of expertise and interest that fits with where the market is at now, but there's no way of, of saying, right? And you don't even know what you lost because this ban was enforced maybe years ago, and then you had generations of investments all over the place, and the whole economy is, is different, structurally speaking. Okay, so how do we use this then? Any ideas? This is probably where I should say, this is the end of my talk by my book, thank you. But let's, let's move on a little bit, okay? Let's talk about the, uh, the sweatshop. Because I think that is a good example of, of this type of analysis. And why is that? Well, because it's usually discussed in terms of the seen and the unseen. But the unrealized is what's real, really important here. Okay, So this is a, a page from, from my book on the, on the sweatshop. Now, we all know what a sweatshop is, these factories or production facilities in, in the developing world where People are working in what to us seems like horrendous work conditions. It's hot, they work long hours, it's terrible. Well, we would never pick a job like that, right? If they offered that type of job to you, you would definitely go for the Biden stimulus money instead. <laughs> well, that's the scene, right? That's how most well, how most leftists argue when they argue the sweatshop. It's terrible conditions. They should have higher pay. They should have more paid vacation. They should have all this stuff. Well, very often we would remind them that, no, 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 there's also the unseen. Right? What would they do if there was no sweatshop there? Right? Very often we know that the people working in sweatshops, they chose to. And very often when, you, when Western companies open a new sweatshop in these countries, people line up and they stand in line just as much as we do for the next Apple product. They do for the job in, in the sweatshop. And why? Because it usually pays a lot better. It's a much better job, better work conditions than the alternatives. So they, it makes them better off overall. Right? That's usually where this... Um, analysis ends, but it shouldn't end here because we're still in, in the world of Milton Friedman and the, those static analysis types, right? Because what can we say if there is a sweatshop actually um, created in one of these countries, it means that the economy can support sweatshops, right? Because they can build the building, there's enough uh, logistics to and fro the workers are there, the machines are available, all of this stuff. Then the question is, why is there only one? Why aren't there a bunch of sweatshops? And of course, if you have a bunch of sweatshops, what do they do? They compete for workers. How do they compete for workers? 
Well, they improve working conditions, they raise wages, they provide more health care benefits and paid vacation and stuff like that, right? Then the option that people have uh, when they choose a job in the sweatshop, which tends to be toiling in the field, starving to death, prostitution, and all those nice options, right? The option is not that. The option they should have had is another job in a sweatshop, right? So they could, they should be able to choose between two, di two different jobs in two different sweatshops where they're competing for their work and their time and their expertise and, or their, at least their la manual labor, right? This is a very different situation. And we know the economy can provide this type of job because it does, but it only does in a few pretty rare uh, sweatshops. Why not a whole lot more? It's not like Nike says, ooh, we can only have one sweatshop for, for Nike sneakers, because Americans don't like to wear sneakers. They can sell billions of sneakers. Right? So they could have another couple of, of sweatshops, or Reebok can have, have one next door, and, and whatever else they're called, the sneakers uh, companies. Right? There could be competition for this labor in this type of production facilities because we already know empirically we can see that the sweatshop works and they can offer much higher pay than any other alternative in this area. Right? So something is wrong. And what is wrong? Well, here's how I describe it in the book. I say that the fact that there are no economic limitations means the market is mature en enough to support this type of production. Meaning simply that there is a sweatshop, so obviously there can be a sweatshop. That's the level of my imagination. We can therefore conclude that the standard of living in the, in the village, where the guy we're following in this example, uh, would likely have been at par with uh, the standard of living you get when working in sweatshop. But the reason he chose that job is that he did not have a standard of living at that level. He would had a standard of living that was much lower, which was, was why his choice to work there was obvious, because it was so much better than his, uh, than his uh, alternative. In other words, the poverty experienced by the villagers is to a significant extent artificial. See what I'm saying here? The reason there's only one sweatshop and all the alternatives are so much worse means something is stopping sweatshops from being established. Because right? the economy can support this, and obviously the, the company who has this sweatshop is making a lot, lot of money too, even at this very higher, much higher wages. So why aren't there more? And why didn't this happen before? Because it's not a technological breakthrough, right? It's artificial. So in this choice situation, when it chooses between the comparatively high-paying job in the sweatshop and the other alternative, toiling in the fields or waving, weaving baskets, it's artificial. It's caused by something. It's not because the economy is in a certain state. The economy is in that certain state for a reason. And it's artificial. It's created. Right? Something is limiting it. Well, what limits the economy? What limits the economy from getting to its potential? Regulations. Those are restrictions imposed on this. And these might not be regulations imposed on just having a sweatshop in this village. This might be regulations somewhere else that distort the whole economy and make it impossible or very costly for entrepreneurs to pursue starting a new sweatshop. Or maybe the villagers to go get together and start their own sweatshop to compete with the one that already exists. See where I'm going with this? This poverty is not natural. This poverty is not, is not, does not come out of the market or the market economy. It's created because an, a limitation is imposed on, on the market. Okay, and that limitation might be anywhere, because we said before that just banning touch screens 
has distortions all over the place. And it changes the options for people basically all over the world. Because other careers, the careers that would have been there are no longer there. The lines of production that would have been there are no longer there. Instead, everything is invested elsewhere. So the whole economy, the structure of the economy, the, produ the, uh, the production structure is out of whack with from the point of view of consumer value. Even worse, because consumer value, we know that that is sort of uncertain what consumers actually will want to buy. It's out of whack with where entrepreneurs would invest their money, where they imagine that they would get the highest return. So if entrepreneurs are not maximizing, uh, given their imagination of what, is, what, what might happen and what they're, they're able to do, well, obviously, something has impacted them. So why would they choose? Oh, there are very few entrepreneurs reason that, like this. So I could make a ton of money over here, and just a little money over here, a little money. That's not how you reason. That's not how you choose. Same thing with the value scale, right? You don't go, ooh, I value these things in this order. I'm going to pick the lowest one or the one in the middle. No, you're going to pick the one of highest value, right? So the reason they're not uh, pursuing these things is that they are not allowed or that the market does not uh, support it. So which one is it? If the market does not support it, well, that's an argument, that's a free market argument. Right? You can't produce uh, iPhones in 1850. You have no knowledge, you have no machinery, you have no nothing to produce those things at that time. But if you can't do it in 2021, Something is stopping you from, from doing that. Right? Those are two different causes that could lead to the same result or similar results. Okay? So if we look at the unrealized, the effect on the entrepreneurs is what's really important here. Right? Because they cannot pursue producing the goods that they think would be of greatest value to consumers. And that's how they make their money. That's, how they, that, that's their whole function in the economy. That's the role of the entrepreneur. They're the driving force of the market process. And they can't really do that the way they want to. They have to pick something else. Or perhaps other entrepreneurs will pursue, pursue uh, opportunities. Because the entrepreneurs who otherwise would have, they imagine things that are not allowed, that are not possible. So they cannot uh, invest in, in where they get, expect the highest return. Some choose not to reinvest at all, and others choose to invest in other places where they might not have uh, enough or as, as good expertise and knowledge. So well, in either case, they're going to distort the, the economic structure, the structure of the market. This, of course, means lower standard of living for everyone, pretty much, unless you're really lucky, because there are fewer and worse options for consumers than what the entrepreneurs, as a class, if you will, would have pursued otherwise. This means that they are creating fewer and lower paying jobs for workers. Why? Well, because they're pursuing a lower value, so obviously they can't pay as high salaries anymore. So workers are worse off too. And then overall, the economy, the structure of the economy is no longer uh, aligned with where entrepreneurs think that the highest value for consumers is at. Which means we have a whole bunch of goods and services and fantastic opportunities all over the marketplace that simply never happen. That we're not going to see because of this regulation that stopped a bunch of entrepreneurs in some place. And I think you can see now that the problem is not as we usually analyze this stuff, saying that, oh, we regulate this space, well, then that's the, the, there are going to be effects in this space. No, because it distorts the structure of the market economy overall. Right? The investments are going elsewhere. Well, that's, those are investments that should not, if you want to be normative, that should not take place because that's not to the best uh, satisfaction of consumers, at least according to entrepreneurs. So there's a problem here, right? 
a regulation way over here will have effects way over here, and vice versa. So there will be ripple effects throughout the economy. Basically, in, in a sense, production, uh, production-based Kantian effects, if you will. Right? Changing and distorting everything, because everything is connected one way or the other in the economy. So more of this in this line of production means less over here, and vice versa. That's going to affect where workers go, how workers educate themselves, and so forth. Okay, so regulations, as I say, in, in, uh, if you want to Google this in a few of, of my talks, I say that, well, even libertarians don't understand how destructive regulations are. Because most libertarians are uh, Chicago school economists. They look at the static picture, right? So they say, oh, yeah, the seen and the unseen. Well, you're missing the big cost of regulation which is the distortive effect of the economy. The economy is completely out of whack with the value creation that is possible. That's the unrealized. That's the major cost of, of regulations. And I think we need to think about that and use that more in our analysis and when we talk about this. this of course, it's a hard case to make when you're, when you're arguing with someone on Twitter. But we need to realize that there's a whole lot more to the story than simply the seen and the unseen. And you need the process perspective, as we do have as Austrians, to realize, no pun intended, the problems with regulations and those types of restrictions added on the economy, imposed on the economy in a limited way, because it's going to have impact on the whole economy. So I'll leave you with just a book cover in case you're interested. And I'll be happy to sign it the next time we meet. Thank you.